Now, as Japheth's family went north, they hit a bunch of glaciers and stuff. And we see where these people actually took up residence in caves and places like that because they could get out of the cold environment very well in these caves. And they did some pretty cool cave art in some of these caves. Um, and we find that they had sewing instruments, they had musical instruments that were very similar to the tonal qualities we use today. They had very cool weapons and stuff. We see a lot of things that are left in those caves. And some of the remains are called Neanderthals because if they had this slightly different head shape or skull shape, we, we classify them as a Neanderthal, and yet Neanderthals were found in the caves with these other people, and this one was buried in a coat of mail. He was a knight. One Neanderthal was found with a bullet wound through his head. That's what killed him. So they weren't ape men, and they didn't live millions of years ago, and actually even the evolutionary scientists will now try to tell you that Neanderthals weren't related to people at all. Well, I would beg to differ with you. Neanderthals were just people with a slightly different skull shape, and this is a, a picture from 1898 of Chief a uh, wolf robe of the Cheyenne Nation, and if you were to take his skull separate from him, you would see he's a Neanderthal. He has a very heavy brow, he has a very sloping back forehead, and he has a very heavy jaw, doesn't he? He's a Neanderthal. No, he's not. He's a person that Jesus Christ died for. Right? So we have to be aware of some of this. As the people separated at the time of the Tower of Babel, they moved apart in people groups. Now let's think. People all have the exact same pigment. It's called melanin. Depending on how white or how dark you are is dependent on how you express that particular pigment, melanin. And within any family, you can get really all the colors of the rainbow. So as the family groups move north, let's say Japheth's people move north, and they had little dark kids, middle kids, and light kids, the dark kids wouldn't have done as well near those glaciers. There was less sunlight. They wouldn't have produced enough folic acid and vitamin D, and therefore they would not have reproduced as readily as the fair-skinned people. So what kind of tribes do you think of when you think of Northern Europe? Vikings, right? Blonde, big, fair skins, you know, because that's the kind of people group that it would have been naturally selected for. The darker skinned people wouldn't have done as well in that environment. Let's take a Ham's family. They go down into Africa. His family would have had blonde, light skinned kids all the way to the dark skinned kids and everything in between too. But now the fair skinned people are going to be selected against because they're in an environment where there's a lot of intense sunlight, isn't there? So they wouldn't have done as well. And so the dark kids would have done better to reproduce and therefore they'd have been naturally selected for and so within a couple generations that family would have looked very dark skinned because those kids would have done better and then the Middle Eastern people you see kind of in between don't you so we I want you to understand that all people are one race even though we put names on them we are all from one race from the children not just Adam and Eve I always say no we're from Noah and his wife you know we go to Noah's family that's where we all come from don't don't we? The three sons of Noah and their wives. And so when you see these slight differences, like people that are Asian, um, like the Oriental peoples, they have the almond eyes with um, the lack of a crease here. That's just because they have a little fat layer up there. There's, you know, I mean, I got fat layers everywhere, you know, that big deal, right? So the point is, oh, and what's really cool is this. Those are twins. <laughs> Aren't they cute? Those are little twin girls. And they've had about I think they said there were 10 different groups of those in the last, you know, 15 years. And I love those little girls. And I can just see when they grow up, when they go, this is my twin sister, everybody going, uh-uh. <laughs> right? Because nobody's going to believe them. Well, how do you get that kind of variation in twins? And I don't know about you, but I know some homeschooling families, same father, same mother, and they had a boy, they had two boys, two girls. One boy and one girl, very light-skinned, very blonde, blue-eyed, the other boy, the other girl, very dark skin, dark hair, dark eyes. You can get that kind of variation in one family, no problem. This, all it requires to get all the different variations in the human genome as far as skin color, all you need is the grandparents to have one, what we would call one black grandparent and one white grandparent on both sides. If you have that, you can get every color of the rainbow in the human. There's like 16 different color types in the human genome, and you can get all of them from that kind of variation. So I just love these twins though. And I can just see the problems they're gonna have in their life, but I love them, I think they're great. When they moved out from each other, they 
started to repopulate the planet. They walked across those land bridges. Are you guys aware that we have pyramid-type structures on every continent that man lives on? Now, remember, God broke it up into seven continents, didn't he? There are seven continents today. How many continents does man live on? Does man live on all seven continents? No, man lives on six in the Bible. Six is the number of man. Seven is the number of completeness. God broke it into seven continents. He only let man live on six. We visit the seventh, which is Antarctica, but we do not live on it, do we? Okay, you can see his providential hand all through this stuff if you look for it. And so they made pyramidal type structures. Literally, do you guys know we have oyster shell pyramids right here in this area? Down south of here, they've actually dug up oyster shell pyramids. And, and the archaeologists are working on them even in this area. So we have all sorts of cool structures. Some of them they're finding out on the continental shelves under about 250 feet of water. <laughs> Guess why? <laughs> this, you know, now you know. I'll give you one. Okay, you ready? They used to do uh, ancient mysteries of the world. And one of them is if you go off the coast of Miami, there's this little island called Bimini in the Bahamas. And, and it's a little tiny seven-mile um, long island. And off the north coast of Bimini is an ancient road underwater and it's an ancient road and it just goes off into nowhere underwater and it's considered one of the ancient mysteries of the world because nobody can figure out who built the road guess what they built the road when it was the ice age and the water was down and then when the water came up bloop, 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 you've got an underwater ancient road right so We've got some cool stuff, but ancient man was smart. And this is where the evolutionists think we came from ape men. So ancient man would have had to be stupid. But the Bible tells us that man was made in God's image. I know the first time I heard this part, I was like, oh, duh, how did I miss this? Okay, because as creationists, we should believe ancient man was smart. Man walked with God. Do you guys realize that Noah's father could have sat and learned from Adam, the man that walked with God? They overlapped each other's lives. I mean... They should have been pretty smart. Plus, they lived an average of 900 years. You'd have to try to be stupid to be stupid in 900 years. Come on. I mean, really. So these people should have been pretty smart. Let me just give you a few. They're called op art, and it's called out-of-place artifacts because what it is is it shows that ancient man was way too smart to have been evolved from apes, basically, is what it gets down to. This is the Pyre Reese map. This map uh, was copied from a map that was found in the 1500s. It was copied from maps that actually dated from before the time of Christ. It has accurate longitudes and latitudes on it, which it shouldn't have if it's from before the time of Christ. It is an accurate portrayal of the shoreline of Antarctica, which is now like 100 to 200 miles back under the ice layers. Okay, um, and it actually shows, I'm thinking this one, nope, this one shows the land bridge. This is also a map, uh, Arantius Veneus, I think that's the name of this map. Um, I'm not real good at Latin, sorry, sorry, especially to the classical conversations people. Um, this map was also from that time period, and it was copied from maps before then. It also has uh, longitudes and latitudes on it, which it shouldn't have because it was copied from before, you know, around the time of Christ also. This one shows the land bridge between South America and Antarctica exposed. This one also, between these two maps, they show that, and... Um, I think this one's the one that actually shows where the mountain ranges are on Antarctica and where the rivers used to run. And all of that is under over a mile deep of glaciers now. And we've only known since the 1950s, that's when we got the equipment that we could tell where the mountain ranges are on Antarctica and where the rivers used to run, that this map is accurate. Cool. Now, what the evolutionists will tell you is spacemen made those maps. Because how could people have mapped that? Because it's, you gotta understand, an evolutionist believes people have only been here for a million years, that we started to evolve about a million years ago, that we were totally apes a million years ago, and we've been evolving since then. So they can't figure out how man could possibly have mapped this when it was ice free. You can. All of a sudden these things aren't mysteries anymore. But from their thinking, they can't explain it. So obviously, spacemen, haven't you guys seen the third Indiana Jones? <laughs> Hello, come on, catch up here. OK, um, this is a, actually, it's a gear-driven computer. Um, 
It's not the kind of computer that has a monitor. This is a, the kind of computer that was used on our battleships up until the 1960s to do the firing arrangements on the 16-inch guns. It's a coral encrusted computer with differential gears and everything. Now, you ready? It was found on a shipwreck in the Aegean Sea from before the time of Christ, from the first century BC. Like that? Yeah. So people were using computers, no monitor, guys, don't get excited, not that kind of computer, but they were using actual computers. Most of us think they were making maps with these, okay, because that would be logical. Why would they would have such great maps that they were actually being able to use these kind of things? So ancient man had some pretty cool technology. This is one of my favorites, though. Uh, this was in a box. This is a little glider. It's about eight inches long, and it was found in a tomb of a pyramid of a mummy in Egypt. They found it in the late 1800s before the Wright brothers had done their thing. So it was stuffed in a box and labeled bird carving. Like that, they were cleaning the museum, found the box like in the 1960s, pulled it out and go, that's no bird. And so they went ahead and started, they got a whole panel together and they started to look at it. It has the same aerodynamic winds, wings of the supersonic concourse that used to fly back and forth supersonic between Europe and uh, New York. Uh, they say that this glider, if it was made into a full size, is so aerodynamically designed that at 45 miles an hour it could uh, carry a huge payload, I know. So, ancient man was able to fly. That's not the only version. That gives you scale, the dime in the picture. Down in South America, they found all sorts of little, what look like planes, little planes in these uh, South American tombs that are over a thousand years old. And so they were labeled by the archeologists as insects, insects, until after World War II, a German pilot that was living in South America saw this and go, that's no insect. It's got avions. It's got rudders. That's a plane. And so apparently ancient man was able to fly. They were great balloonists too. We know that from uh, the Nazca Desert. In the Nazca Desert, which is the driest place on earth, um, they actually find pottery which shows that they were balloonists. And within the remains that they find, balloonists, you know, hot air balloons, they find um, the black material that they used for their balloons that would create the hot air because the black material would heat the air that was in it and it would go up and it was still intact because it's got the highest tensile strength of anything they've ever been able to find and they can't figure out how ancient man did it.